I mean, your book it has the title uh, The Morality of, of China in Africa. What is the morality of China in Africa? How do you even approach that dimension? What I was gearing off uh, from was the entire Western uh, concern with Chinese penetration of Africa. And of course, what lies behind Western concern is a very great deal of angst about future resources, who's going to be there to claim those resources, who's go going to build up the best economic and trading relationships. But a lot of Western discourse is cloaked in the rhetoric of democratic values, etc., etc., saying that the Chinese don't really care for any of these values. But that Western values are basically ethical ones, uh, they're basically moral ones, so what I wanted to do was to introduce into the debate the idea that the Chinese do have a moral perspective as well. Now, I don't want to say that that's all they have, because that's patently untrue. They do want to have access to all kinds of resources. They do want to build their own economic structure, and at the same time, hopefully, uh, some of this will be two-way and they'll benefit and benefit the African economic structures. I think that there's all kinds of things to play for in terms of high finance, but also perhaps in terms of future strategic leverage. Uh, there's a growing Chinese navy, for instance, and it's patrolling uh, the waters of Somalia already. So the Chinese have got all kinds of future interests, but they do have some kind of moral ethos which prevents them from going too far in some of the economic exploitations uh, they are obliged when entering into friendships with countries whom they would regard as younger brother countries to behave like an older brother. And that is with a certain Confucian ethos of responsibility for those who are younger but who are still members of the same family. So what I've tried to do is to say, well, what does this Confucian ethos look like in international relations and particularly in the international economic relations between China and the very different African countries. There are 54 of them. And the trick is very much not to think the Chinese approach all of them in exactly the same way. So what is that Confucian? At first, what you've just described, the sort of elder brother type thing. Yeah. How does it play out? What you've got, let us again uh, contrast it with Western discourse on democratic values, which begins with a, a basic premise that everybody is equal. And so equality and equal opportunity to express yourself, equality of citizenship to vote for your own government, all of these things lie at the base of the Western approach to its political values. Now, this idea of equality does not exist in Chinese political philosophy. In Confucian philosophy, what you're looking at is not equality, but reciprocity. So that's the buzzword. So the idea is that you don't have a flat line where everybody is equal. You do have a vertical line, and it's a hierarchical line. However, the dynamics within that hierarchical line is that everybody who's one step above that which is below has a responsibility to that person or that level uh, that is below. And the person on top can't demand anything of the lower level unless reciprocation, as it were, has been paid up front. So when you look at how the Chinese front load their economic expansion in Africa, all kinds of, let us say, economic and financial gifts, all kinds of infrastructural projects that rates of the West simply could not match, all kinds of investment into infrastructure that Africa really needs, uh, then you can see how there's a certain Confucian value that's very, very evident. So I've tried to describe what a Chinese person, I think, would find quite obvious, but which has escaped the Western discourse. That's right. People here would say, oh, look, they've built a big road and a big stadium and a big opera house. They're obviously trying to buy influence. That's corruption. Well, I think that we've built things too. Only our scale of building seems to be much smaller these days. So it's not as if uh, we've not been uh, above uh, the so-called bribery or sort of good offices type of game. But the Chinese really do do this as a token of goodwill along, as I said, Confucian lines. And to be fair to the Chinese, they do things that they're good at, so that they are good at building roads, they're good at civil engineering, uh, they're good at uh, railways, and they're good also at picking up on what people want and what will have, as it were, a multiplier effect. 
uh, a road and a railway has a huge knock-on effect in terms of opening up area and facilitating communications and facilitating local trade, for instance, local travel. What the Chinese are also doing these days is building infrastructure along the line of rail or along the motorway. So they're putting in schools and they're putting in clinics, they're putting in hospitals. Now, uh, this, I think, is something which the West really hasn't caught, as it were, a proper appreciation of. Uh, the Chinese are prepared to build entire universities along the line of rail, or along the line of road. Uh, we have this very limited ethos in Western development assistance that, yeah, education is important, let's build these guys some primary schools, uh, as if that's all they needed, some basic literacy. Uh, the Chinese, because they came out of deprivation themselves just very, very recently, and a very great deal of the countryside is still within deprivation, the Chinese understand uh, something which you don't have to knock too hard to find in Africa, and that is the power of aspiration. Actually, you don't want your kids just to stop at primary school. Uh, you want them to go on to secondary school. You want them to go on to university. This is a natural desire, and it's an aspiration for a future which is better and an aspiration for a future which is educated. And I think the Chinese have cottoned on to that very, very well indeed. So they're prepared to go the whole hog and not put a glass ceiling, as it were. You can come up so far and you can't come up any further. So in some ways, yeah, it's naked, as it were, buying goodwill. No doubt about that. It can be as Confucian as it gets, but it's still naked buying of goodwill. But it's the naked buying of goodwill that has been very well thought out. Why haven't Western countries done any of this? And it seems very obvious. Build a road, you know, build a, a railway. You know, why well, why not indeed? I know we do build roads and railways and things like that, but we do seem to have ceilings to what we'll do. As I say, our financing of primary schools and, you know, not much investment going uh, into education beyond that is a case in point. And sometimes I think that we're still victims here in the West of the mentality that we developed for ourselves when we were colonial and imperial powers. And the colonial legacy on the part of the West is not a pretty one in Africa. We were pretty downright patronizing, condescending, and very often quite vicious in our approach uh, to the way that we treated African people particularly when they started demanding more for themselves, and particularly when they decided to start demanding independence for themselves. Uh, we thought they weren't ready. Uh, we thought they would never be educated this side of uh, the 20th century. Well, not until this side of the 20th century. The original plans were that independence would not be granted until the 1990s. The fact that they came 30 years earlier came with all kinds of forebodings in many policy circles that this is 30 years too early, the Africans will never be ready. But this kind of condescension, I think, we've carried with us right through to the present age. Barack Obama was in Africa of late. Uh, he took a swipe at China, I think. While saying, I welcome uh, everybody in Africa, he also said Africans should be very clear about whether they're getting a good deal or not, you know. Are the jobs for Africans? Uh, is the money staying in Africa? The, is, is it basically a good deal for Africa? Uh, was he? Are those justified? Yeah. Criticism? Yeah, they're justified, but you could make exactly the same criticism about a lot of American aid. <laughs> you can make the same criticism about the British, the French, certainly the Chinese. Nobody's exempt from uh, you know, this kind of criticism. Of course, Obama was very much concerned to try to push forward uh, U.S. interests. Uh, that's why you make state visits at such a high level. But he also knows that he has been rather dilatory, very tardy in doing this. When you look how many times Chinese presidents and prime ministers have come out to Africa and accorded to the African nations that they visit, you know, all this prestige of the head of a very, very powerful state uh, coming to take an interest in you. And you contrast that with how few times senior Western leaders have gone out to Africa. I think that Obama has only been once each of his two presidential terms. And on this visit only went to three countries. Uh, whereas you know, the Chinese will come in style and in strength and frequently uh, to give, as it were, their respect to African leaders. And the trick is that 
I think that uh, whoever advises Obama has got to be careful. He's a really great speaker, there's no doubt. And anybody's a, approach to rhetoric, uh, this man sort of cuts the mustard. He knows how to speak. And people, even if they don't understand his language, would be beguiled by just how well he speaks. Uh, so that's appreciated. But when you look at the transcript of what he says and you read it in black and white, uh, then again, it's condescending, as if Africa couldn't make choices and has got to be warned to be careful of the big bad Chinese. Uh, but in fact, in African policy circles, there's just great delight that finally uh, governments get to make choices. It doesn't have to be just America, it doesn't have to be just Britain, and it doesn't have to be just China. Finally, you get a chance to play one suitor off against another. So there would have been much, let us say, a scratching of heads and raising of eyebrows when the African ministers and prime ministers and presidents read the transcript of these brilliant speeches, and they would have been thinking, you know, who does this man think he is? What about the environmental footprint of these uh, Chinese projects and uh, plans and, uh, and the uh, activity that their companies are carrying out there? This is another one that my news editor has, has thrown in. You know, they, there's a lot going on, but is it responsible on a, an ecological and social level? I think you have uh, all kinds of ifs and buts about that and some projects or programs are going to be more ecologically friendly or sustainable than others but again this is a critique that you could level at corporations and governments of every single stripe uh, what Shell uh, has done uh, in the Delta uh, region of Nigeria for instance the huge despolation of uh, the environmental resources there uh, is a case in point now, a lot of Chinese mining activities could do a lot better, not only in terms of ecological preservation, but certainly in terms of human resource management, you know, like they could obey <laughs> the laws of the country when it comes to labor relations and labor rates, for instance. So there's lots of shortcuts being taken by the Chinese among many other people who've gone out to, as it were, benefit economically in Africa. Now, having said that, uh, what you've got in Africa is a huge rush to industrialize. Now, we could tut tut at that, say, what are these people doing? But they realize that unless they do that, they're going to be forever doomed to being the providers of raw materials and raw resources. They're always going to be at someone's beck and call. Whereas if you're able to ma put manufacture onto those resources, if you're, if you're able to what they call beneficiate those resources, uh, you know, take part in the chain of manufacture, then your, as it were, scope for negotiation, your scope for leverage in the international trade negotiations is just so much greater. Now, everyone understands that when you start the manufacturing chain, you're also entering an era where there's all kinds of environmental consequences. Uh, again, having said that, the Africans could benefit very, very much from some of the new Chinese technologies which are very green in terms of industrial production. The Chinese have taken a very, very good look at what a mess they've made of the environments around some of their biggest cities. And all kinds of new laws and all kinds of new technologies are being pioneered in China, uh, much more so than here. Not universally and not uniformly, so you still go to Beijing and you still can't see the sky and you never will for the next 10 years. But in some parts, some of the green technologies are very, very impressive. So if they can export some of those to the African projects, uh, there might be greater protection of the environment than in many other projects by many other people. I saw that the Chinese issued a set of environmental guidelines for their state-owned enterprises in April, I think, <coughs> which are basically a lot of rules saying, you know, be, carry out uh, impact assessment studies and you know, take into account yeah. all this stuff. Um, is that something that we can take seriously? I mean, is, is, do, we, do we regard that as uh, just a, a sort of a bureaucratic facade, or is it something that... No, really it's, it's no more of a facade than the international agreements on climate change and the Kyoto targets and this set of targets and that set of targets. Uh, the whole world agrees on these targets, and then we go and miss them. Uh, so, yeah, the Chinese are going to miss a lot of their targets. Uh, the idea is that there should be targets, however, so that eventually governments can begin tightening up 
and just how much you can miss them by. Uh, this is a first step in trying to get, as it were, some kind of regime of environmental legislation up and running. But yeah, it's going to take time for actuality to catch up with good intentions and to catch up with legislation. But I don't think it's a front. Uh, I do think there is some serious long-term, as it were, intent behind this. Not least because in China, people are themselves pissed off with having to live in smog. You know, this angst that you were talking about, you know, it seems to me that the Chinese don't, aren't effectively able to counter the kind of sour grapes, angst and general uh, negativity that is kind of flung at them by people in the West who are, to my mind, basically a bit irritated at the emergence of competitor and what they believe mm. is their backyard. Well, that's right, but don't forget, the Chinese have been in Africa ever since independence, and they supported lots of independence movements. So even before the country became formally independent, and they were there. It's just that the latest iteration of the Chinese presence, uh, in terms of its economic, uh, as it were, intent and impact, that's what's alarmed uh, the West. But the Chinese have already proved their bona fides in many parts of Africa well beyond uh, this present moment in time. Uh, the Chinese are going to have a mixed record. They're going to basically screw up uh, a lot. But you're quite right in the sense that they still haven't worked out in particular how to couch all of this within good international public relations. They really don't know how to spin this for Western consumption. And when they try, it's extraordinarily clumsy. So coming out of the kind of shell that you develop when you have an official media that spins government and party policy in a certain way for local consumption, coming out of that shell and being able to do a very different kind of spin for a more pluralistic approach to society. Uh, yeah, their efforts are incredibly clumsy. So when I talk to Chinese journalists or uh, Chinese television interviewers or whatever, they haven't got a clue uh, how to present uh, someone who might have different points of view while being broadly sympathetic to what the Chinese are doing. So that the interview you and I are doing right now, and I've said one or two, as it were, critical things about the Chinese effort in Africa, as well as some positive things, trying to be even-handed and balanced, uh, a producer in China wouldn't have a clue how to do you know, the production job, the post-production job on this interview. But is it the case that basically China is doing better for, for the purposes of Africans developing than their countries than Western engagement is? It depends. Some countries benefit more from one country, you know, one country's largesse than uh, than others. For instance, the Japanese build really good roads as well. They just can't build as many of them as uh, the Chinese can. But uh, there are many parts of uh, Africa where American projects or French projects or British projects offer far superior outcomes than, say, Chinese projects. Uh, very, very much, I think, the key to the future is letting African governments and publics uh, have a choice as to how they want to see their country develop and what partnerships they want to form uh, for the future. Uh, so I'm quite content with there being an open door policy right now, provided the Africans choose who they're going to open the door to and who they're going to close the door to. What choices are they making at the moment? Some are right, some are wrong, some are total screw-up choices, some are very, very far-sighted choices. Uh, don't forget, we've been having some lessons in the early part of the 21st century about just how awful Western governments are in terms of handling their own economics. Uh, we're having some awful lessons in just how corrupt Westminster politicians can be. Uh, you know, the, the scandals over their expenses and things like that. So we've seen lots of, let us say, malpractice and malhandling of affairs at home. Uh, it's not going to be beyond one's imagination to accept that there's going to be a lot of malpractice in Africa in terms of Africa's relations with China, with us, and with everybody else. The problem when you've been poor and when you're climbing quite rapidly out of poverty, and I think that's the key, uh, it's quite a rapid climb out of poverty right now in many parts of Africa, you could have very uneven practices as well as very uneven results. You're probably going too far too fast. And this creates all kinds of incidental opportunities to, let us say, take an informal share <laughs> of what's sloshing around, 
yeah, that's happening. There's lots of corruption. Lots of very wicked people are getting very, very rich. But you know what? You go back something like 150 years and you look at the rail barons in the United States, you look at some very famous family names in America now who are, as it were, the elite with huge apartments on Fifth Avenue overlooking Central Park and their names endow all kinds of very famous and generous philanthropic foundations, etc., etc. They began as crooks. Uh, same thing, same era, same phenomenon you can see in several dozen African countries right now. Uh, these will be famous names that will be very respectable names, very generous names in the future. Uh, right now, yes, they should be taken out and shot, uh, but no one's going to do that. Western countries make a, a big hoo-ha about their kind of human rights-based uh, choices uh, when, it, when it comes to their dealings with uh, various other countries. And the Chinese, by contrast, have a very uh, a state of, you know, we don't interfere position. And that attracts a lot of criticism as well because they're charged with uh, propping up dictators because they want to go into... Yeah, no, that's true. It's been nuanced a little bit of late. And the Chinese peacekeeping presence has been greatly... Uh, increased in many parts of Africa. Uh, they've got a big peacekeeping presence now in uh, Sudan and Darfur, in fact, uh, where they had been previously been accused of being complicit with the Sudanese government. Uh, they're going to send troops to Mali uh, to try to keep the peace there after the um, outbreak of war, the civil war in Mali recently. But yeah, they're complicit with governments. Uh, yes, they are very, very wicked from time to time. No one's going to deny this. Um, what I'm trying to say is that despite all of this, it's not a blanket indictment of wickedness, however, that we should be delivering. And in order to get the full picture that you've got to be able to inject into the discussions about this full picture, the question of do they also have a moral base, even if they depart from that moral base, just as we depart from our own moral base. But this is just a question about our own prejudice towards the Chinese, right? Uh, I think it's historically there's a prejudice and I'm very mindful of that having grown up Chinese in Western countries uh, and it's definitely been there until quite recently uh, and even now uh, it's still it's lurking behind the scenes. You look at our combined houses of parliament, that's both the lower house uh, elected and the upper house which can be appointed uh, and you would think that at least in the upper house where we're just a a slight of political hand, you can appoint people of certain complexions to pretend to make up the numbers. But in the combined houses of parliament, there are two Chinese legislators. Um, they've just been forgotten by the body politic. They've been forgotten by the patronage machine. Uh, they're simply invisible. So if you keep your head down and you're a good boy and you make lots of money and you contribute quietly to society, no one cares about you, but at the same time, no one looks to see whether they can do anything for you. The Chinese are not important. Now, when suddenly internationally they become important, this raises all kinds of questions of well, how are we meant to deal with these people, particularly after, don't forget, uh, there are several centuries of recent modern history where we dealt with the Chinese internationally in quite a wretched way. Uh, our basically decision to force uh, opium upon the Chinese people and to fight the opium wars, uh, very much to propagate our economic interests, you know, to create a nation of addicts and then to force them by, you know, armed might uh, to remain in this kind of condition. Uh, you know, that kind of thing is not a very pretty picture. So it's taken our diplomacy actually quite some time to catch up with the fact that we've got to step away from the shadow of what we used to do diplomatically uh, to a more equal a relationship with the Chinese. I think there's a popular fear of China because it's a lot of people. Uh, people ask themselves the question, well, what's going to happen when they're in charge? And then I think also there's a sort of plucky Britain still refusing to kowtow to the uh, Chinese emperor type trope that uh, people want to persist with. And I think it does lead to internationally a uh, added to what you were talking about, an unwillingness really to, to meet the Chinese on a level. No, this is true. Don't forget the Chinese have got all kinds of tropes about European and American nations as well. There's lots of screwy perceptions and ways of handling these screwy perceptions on all sides. 
I hope that gradually uh, these kinds of tropes will disappear or become more humane. I don't think they'd totally ever disappear. I mean, it's amazing how popular culture can sometimes break down all kinds of uh, barriers. Uh, so I'm a great fan, for instance, of Chinese cinema. And it's almost deliberate, as it were, stylization to attract an international audience. Uh, that's done no end of good in terms of using artistry as a means of international communication. So those kinds of things can work. But the Chinese have had a long-standing admiration for different other countries of the world. Their modern era has seen the rise of America, the rise of Britain. And these countries in Chinese uh, are given the names of the beautiful country. Uh, that's for America. Uh, and the great country, harking back to Britain's uh, era of being in charge of an empire. So the Chinese have biases, just like anyone else, but at the same time, they've got some admirations. We've got to build up some of our admirations as well as our biases. Mm. And just coming back to Africa, in 10 years, what will, be, what will we be looking at when we consider China in Africa? Actually, we'll be looking much more at how the Africans are responding to the Chinese. Already this is starting. Uh, in terms of the negotiating pushback. Now, at first, lots of African negotiating teams didn't quite know how to handle the Chinese, but they've been learning. Curiously, countries like Angola have learned to negotiate much better in recent years. But this is uh, England, we're little Englanders, we don't like the European Union, we certainly can't speak Portuguese, and so we don't understand what the Angolans have been doing, uh, both in the Portuguese language, but also in their newfound mastery of Chinese language. So it was always only a matter of time before the Africans learnt how to push back in the negotiating um, conditions. And they're starting to do that now. So there'll be a much more egalitarian, as it were, ethos in terms of the relationships between individual African countries and the Chinese. This is not going to all happen all at once. Uh, I think the Namibians, for instance, just south of Angola, have just been done over by the Chinese in terms of the platinum, platinum mining deal, uh, for instance. So you've got good cases here and bad cases there. But 10 years' time, yeah, there'll be far greater equalization in terms of this desire to learn how to be more adept at negotiating with the Chinese. And will we see a similar kind of increased egalitarianism in the interactions between African countries and Western countries? Ah, yeah, because we'll see how successful the Chinese are and we'll start begging the Africans to be nice to us. This could be fun to be an African in 10 years' time. Awesome. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you right. so much. Just in time.